Hi, I'm Tom Long, and this week we are in the town of Oak Island, North Carolina. We'll be walking from the Intracoastal Waterway on the north side, starting at Maymore Park, down the Barbie Trail to Shipwreck Park, and onto the beach at the south side. As we walk, I'll be sharing my thoughts on the Gospel reading for Christmas Eve morning, Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. So let's get started. As you and I both know, Christmas began when 4th century Christians attached the events of Jesus' birth to the Romans' traditional date of the winter solstice, which just happens to be nine months after the spring solstice, which is when many Christians celebrate the Annunciation described in today's reading. Fast forward to the present day, and the religious meaning of Christmas is becoming harder to find. Christmas has been increasingly commercialized and secularized, we know this. To some, Christmas has become more about nostalgia. Even in my beloved Hallmark movies, which often show people going to church, one thing we never hear is the name Jesus. Not that I'm complaining about that, The world can consider their version of Christmas to be a gift to our culture from Christ followers, a gift that brings many people joy and entertainment. And one more thing, how many times have you heard someone say, Christmas is all about family? Well, for us in the Christian faith, Advent is the season in which we celebrate the coming of the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us. In the Older Testament, we see the promise of the Messiah appearing in many of the covenants, such as the Abrahamic covenant, but most significantly in the Davidic covenant. We also see the coming of Messiah layered into Isaiah and Micah's prophecies about his coming. And then, in today's reading, we have the most amazing foretelling of Christ's coming of any of them. And as you walk with me, I want to share what I've come to understand as the way Mary moves from being troubled to spontaneously bursting forth in a song of praise for God. What changed? The first character in our story is Elizabeth, but we'll get back to her in a minute. The second character is Gabriel. Gabriel is described as a messenger from God. Since he was a supernatural messenger, today we would refer to him as an angel. Gabriel once described himself this way, quote, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Mary, a teenage girl who is betrothed but not yet married, is visited by this angel of God. It would be no surprise if such a young girl would be scared out of her wits by an angelic visitation. Traditional art depicts Gabriel as mild in appearance in contrast to the cherubim and seraphim of Isaiah 6. We don't know. (laughs) Some paintings show Mary bowing to Gabriel, at least one by Bartolome Esteban Murillo shows Gabriel bowing to Mary with his sandals removed from his feet in a nod to Moses taking off his sandals when God appeared to him in the burning bush. It was indeed a holy moment. We're not talking about a benign treetop or angel, but literally someone who has come from the presence of God. As far as we can tell from the Bible, Gabriel had been on a break since he appeared in a couple of visions to Daniel in the Older Testament, uh, you know, about uh, six centuries before this. The descriptions of the angels we read about in Isaiah 6 make them seem to be awe-inspiring, if not downright scary. But we don't know what form Gabriel was in. God sometimes speaks to his people through his prophets, sometimes in visions. The Apostle Paul was even caught up into heaven for a vision. And those scenarios would certainly be terrifying (laughs) for a teenage girl, which is exactly who our central character was. One of the ways that Gabriel's appearance to Mary differed from his appearance to Daniel was that Gabriel, instead of appearing in an apocalyptic vision, 
visits her in the familiar surroundings of her hometown of Nazareth. And there Gabriel made this first announcement. Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Yet we're told that Mary was greatly troubled and didn't know what to make of what was happening. We'll see in a moment how that changed. But first, Gabriel encourages her not to be afraid and gets right to the messages he was sent to deliver. The Lord is with you. You found favor with God. You'll give birth to Jesus. Jesus will be great. Jesus will be called the Son of the Most High. God will give him the throne of David forever. <laughs> Hearing these fantastic pronouncements that she's going to be the mother of the long-awaited king, Mary raises a question. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? Gabriel explains that the Holy Spirit will work this miracle and repeats that the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. No response from Mary. Perhaps Gabriel took a breath before continuing. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month for no word from God will ever fail. Now, Mary has the assurance that an older relative is going to likewise be going through a birth that is a miraculous work of God. And so, Mary, this teenage girl, presented with what could be the probability of bearing the stigma of giving birth to a child with no visible father, this Mary, now knowing Elizabeth will be with her in this, responds, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. <laughs> am I overplaying the significance of having family support? Well, just look at what Mary does next. She rushes out of town to talk to Elizabeth. Mary may have been worried that her family would ostracize her. Instead, we are told that John the Baptist leaped in Elizabeth's womb and Elizabeth prophesied. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Instead of rejection, Elizabeth receives Mary with honor. What a relief. Mary's so excited. She breaks into the song now known as the Magnificat, starting with, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Even Joseph who intended to call off the marriage, when told by an angel the facts of the case, did what the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. Centuries of waiting for a promise to be fulfilled had come down to this. An angel tells a teenager, she will be the mother of the Lord and prepares her family to give her the support that she needs. She responds to the Lord's will with her own willingness and finally with a song of praise. I believe God has a plan for each of us. God's plan for me is not as significant as his plan was for Mary or as scary. Still, I'm grateful that I don't need to respond in my own power and without the support of those who love me. I like the toast at the end of the Hallmark movie, If You Believe, to family who can be friends and friends who can be family. This passage leaves me with a few things on which to meditate. Who are my Elizabeths and Josephs who will stand with me in my faith walk? To whom am I called to be an Elizabeth or Joseph? The kingdom Jesus came to bring, 
he is still bringing today through us, using his people to bring that love, mercy, justice, and humble service to the world. If we're going to respond like Mary, we're going to need each other's help and support. So, in a way, maybe Christmas is about family after all.